The popular modern scientific materialist atheist worldview propagated by NASA, the mainstream media, and the public education system is that you are here because nothingness, for no reason, exploded and created everything. Before time, space, matter, consciousness, intelligence, and life, there was nothing. Then the nothingness exploded. And instead of destroying things, like every other explosion ever, this explosion created things created everything. The nothingness explosion somehow created space, time, and all matter in the universe in an instant and for no reason at all. Then all of the creationary explosive debris flying outward at over 670 million miles per hour for 14 billion years culminated to create you. Yes, first some of the more gaseous nothing came together forming suns and stars, then solid pieces of the nothing came together, forming planets and moons. Then the nothing turned hydrogen and oxygen came together, forming water on the nothing planet Earth, out of which single-celled living organisms magically appeared, got to work dividing and multiplying into multi-celled conscious organisms, which multiplied and divided and mutated into various forms of sea life, which adapted and evolved and crawled onto land, replacing gills with lungs, lost tails, grew opposable thumbs, and started grasping at straws like this ridiculous nihilistic notion of Big Bang evolution. This anti-God materialist theory of evolution has been staunchly protected by the infallibility of science for over 150 years, but in actual fact, just as science has failed to find one true, valid proof that Earth is a ball spinning around the sun, scientists have failed to discover a single piece of evidence that the material world is a product of blind chance evolution. Furthermore, Big Bang evolution actually requires and presupposes many other claims which have already been proven false in previous chapters, such as the plurality of worlds, Newton's theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of relativity, stars being distant suns, and Earth being a planet, not a plane. Harun Yahya wrote, Evolutionary theory claims that life started with the cell that formed by chance. According to this scenario, four billion years ago, various lifeless chemical compounds underwent a reaction in the primordial atmosphere on the Earth in which the effects of thunderbolts and atmospheric pressure led to the formation of the first living cell. The first thing that must be said is that the claim that inanimate materials can come together to form life is an unscientific one that has not been verified by any experiment or observation. Life is only generated from life. Each living cell is formed by the replication of another cell. No one in the world has ever succeeded in forming a living cell by bringing inanimate materials together, not even in the most advanced laboratories. The theory of evolution faces no greater crisis than on the point of explaining the emergence of life. The reason is that organic molecules are so complex that their formation cannot possibly be explained as being coincidental, and it is manifestly impossible for an organic cell to have been formed by chance. How could all the interconnected and compartmentalized components, the cell wall, the cell membrane, the mitochondria, proteins, DNA, RNA, ribosomes, lysosomes, cytoplasm, vacuoles, nucleus, and other cell parts magically come together and create conscious, intelligent life from unconscious, dead matter. Just making one average-sized protein molecule is already composed of 288 amino acids of 12 varying types, which can be combined to 10 to the 300th power different ways. Of all those possibilities, only one forms the desired protein molecule, and there are over 600 types of proteins combined in the smallest bacteria ever discovered. Astronomer Fred Hoyle compared the odds that all the multifaceted and multifunctional parts of a cell could coincidentally come together and create life analogous to a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. Hoyle wrote that, if there were a basic principle of matter which somehow drove organic systems toward life, its existence should easily be demonstrable in the laboratory. One could, for instance, take a swimming bath to represent the primordial soup 
fill it with any chemicals of a non-biological nature you please, pump any gases over it or through it you please, and shine any kind of radiation on it that takes your fancy. Let the experiment proceed for a year and see how many of those 2,000 enzymes, protein produced by living cells, have appeared in the bath. I will give the answer, and so save all the time and trouble and expense of actually doing the experiment. You will find nothing at all, except possibly for a tarry sludge composed of amino acids and other simple organic chemicals. Even if scientists placed all the chemical substances necessary for life in a tank, applied to them any processes of their choice, and waited for billions of years, not a single living cell could or would ever form. Astrobiologist Chandra Wickraman Singh wrote, The likelihood of the spontaneous formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 zeros after it. It is big enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. The beginnings of life were not random. They must have been the product of purposeful intelligence. From my earliest training as a scientist, I was very strongly brainwashed to believe that science cannot be consistent with any kind of deliberate creation. That notion has had to be painfully shed. At the moment, I can't find any rational argument to knock down the view which argues for conversion to God. We used to have an open mind. Now we realize that the only logical answer to life is creation, and not accidental random shuffling. Harun Yahya wrote, Scientific proofs from such branches of science as paleontology, microbiology, and anatomy reveal evolution to be a bankrupt theory. It has been stressed that evolution is incompatible with scientific discoveries, reason, and logic. Those who believe in the theory of evolution think that a few atoms and molecules thrown into a huge vat could produce thinking, reasoning professors, university students, scientists, artists, antelopes, lemon trees, and carnations. Moreover, the scientists and professors who believe in this nonsense are educated people. That is why it is quite justifiable to speak of the theory of evolution as the most potent spell in history. Never before has any other belief or idea so taken away people's powers of reason, refused to allow them to think intelligently and logically, and hidden the truth from them as if they had been blindfolded. Consciousness, life, the beautiful diversity, complexity, and interconnectedness of nature and the universe simply could not be the result of some random coincidental physical phenomenon. If the likelihood of life forming from inanimate matter is 1 to the 10 to the 40,000th power, then those are precisely the magnificent odds against which the universe could be unintelligently designed. Even the simple formation of DNA and RNA molecules are similarly beyond the reach of chance to come together, equivalent to 1 times 10 to the 600th power, or 10 with 600 zeros afterwards. Such a mathematical improbability actually so closely borders the impossible that the word improbable becomes misleading. Mathematicians who regularly work with these infinitesimally small numbers say anything beyond 10 to the 50th power should be considered, for all intents and purposes, impossible. Dr. Leslie Orgel, an associate of Francis Crick, the discoverer of DNA, wrote, It is extremely improbable that proteins and nucleic acids, both of which are structurally complex, arose spontaneously in the same place at the same time yet it also seems impossible to have one without the other. And so, at first glance, one might have to conclude that life could never, in fact, have originated by chemical means. Or as Turkish evolutionist professor Ali Demirsoy stated, the probability of the coincidental formation of cytochrome C, just one of the essential proteins for life, is as unlikely as the possibility of a monkey writing the history of humanity on a typewriter without making any mistakes. Some metaphysical powers beyond our definition must have acted in its formation. Harun Yahya wrote, Let us suppose that millions of years ago a cell was formed which had acquired everything necessary for life, and that it duly came to life. The theory of evolution again collapses at this point, for even if this cell had existed for a while, it would eventually have died, and after its death, nothing would have remained, and everything would have been reverted to where it had started. This is because the first living cell, lacking any genetic information, would not have been able to reproduce and start a new generation. 
life would have ended with its death. The genetic system does not only consist of DNA, the following things must also exist in the same environment. Enzymes to read the code on the DNA, messenger RNA to be produced after reading these codes, a ribosome to which messenger RNA will attach according to this code, transfer RNA to transfer the amino acids to the ribosome for use in production, and extremely complex enzymes to carry out numerous intermediary processes. Such an environment cannot exist anywhere apart from a totally isolated and completely controlled environment, such as the cell, where all the essential raw materials and energy resources exist. The Big Bang theory is easily proven false, as the nature of explosions is to destroy, to break things down into their constituent parts, increasing chaos and decreasing order. Explosions simply do not and cannot create things, causing disparate parts to combine into more ordered wholes as the Big Bang theory contends. Similarly, the theory of evolution is proven false by entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. It is a fact that systems left to their own devices tend to become corrupted, disordered, and dispersed over time. All things, living or not, wear out, deteriorate, and decay. They do not spontaneously come together over time in incredibly implausible combinations, creating diverse, complex, and beautiful living forms. Thus, the theory of evolution is in direct opposition to the law of entropy. Evolution supposes things become more ordered, more structured, and more complex over time. But from rust to mold to rotting corpses, nature is everywhere at odds with such a notion. Furthermore, according to the Le Chatelier principle in chemistry, life could not have been formed in the sea as evolutionists allege anyway, since the peptide bond created by amino acid chains produces water molecules, it is not possible for such a reaction to take place in a hydrous environment. Harun Yahya wrote, Organic matter can self-reproduce only if it exists as a fully developed cell with all its organelles in an appropriate environment where it can survive, exchange materials, and get energy from its surroundings. This means that the first cell on Earth was formed all of a sudden, together with its amazingly complex structure. What would you think if you went out hiking in the depth of a thick forest and ran across a brand new car among the trees? Would you imagine that various elements in the forest had come together by chance over millions of years and produced such a vehicle? All the parts in the car are made of products such as iron, copper, and rubber, the raw ingredients for which are all found on the earth. But would this fact lead you to think that these materials had synthesized by chance and then come together and manufactured such a car? There is no doubt that anyone with a sound mind would realize that the car was a product of an intelligent design, in other words, a factory, and wonder what it was doing there in the middle of the forest. The sudden emergence of a complex structure in a complete form, quite out of the blue, shows that this is the work of an intelligent agent. An extraordinarily complex system like the cell is no doubt created by a superior will and wisdom. In other words, it came into existence as a creation of God. Many facets of nature are far too complex, specialized, and perfect to have arisen simply due to blind chance changes over time. For example, the eye, with its various parts and mechanisms all working together with the brain producing the sharpest, clearest 3D color images imaginable. Even the most advanced cameras and plasma screens ever produced by humans cannot provide an image as perfect in detail and clarity as our own eyes. Charles Darwin, the originator of the theory of evolution himself, admitted that the thought of the eye made him cold all over, as he knew what an impassable obstacle the eye presented for his theory. And it is the same with ears and audio equipment. For over a century, many thousands of researchers, scientists, and engineers have been working in factories across the world trying to produce sharper, clearer audio and video playing and recording devices, never coming close to the capabilities and perfection of the human ear and eye. Harun Yahya wrote, Look at the book you read, your hands with which you hold it, then lift your head and look around you. Have you ever seen such a sharp and distinct image as this one at any other place? Even the most developed television screen produced by the greatest television producer in the world cannot provide such a sharp image for you. This is a three-dimensional, colored, and extremely sharp image. No one would say that a hi-fi or a camera came into being as a result of chance. 
So how can it be claimed that the technologies that exist in the human body, which are superior even to these, could have come into being as a result of a chain of coincidences called evolution? It is evident that the eye, the ear, and indeed all the parts of the human body are products of a very superior creation. Charles Darwin, in his Origin of Species, the veritable Bible of atheist materialists, stated that, If my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties, linking most closely all of the species of the same group together, must assuredly have existed. Consequently, evidence of their former existence could be found only amongst fossil remains. Darwin himself knew no such transitional forms had been discovered and hoped that they would be found in the future. He even admitted in his Difficulties on the Theory chapter that these missing intermediate forms were the biggest stumbling block for his theory. He called it the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Harun Yahya wrote, According to the theory of evolution, every living species has emerged from a predecessor. One species which existed previously turned into something else over time, and all species have come into being in this way. According to the theory, this transformation proceeds gradually over millions of years. If this were the case, then innumerable intermediary species should have lived during the immense period of time when these transformations were supposedly occurring. For instance, there should have lived in the past some half-fish, half-reptile creatures which had acquired some reptilian traits in addition to the fish traits which they already had, or there should have existed some reptile bird creatures which had acquired some avian traits in addition to the reptilian traits they already possessed. Evolutionists refer to these imaginary creatures, which they believe to have lived in the past, as transitional forms. If such animals had really existed, there would have been millions, even billions of them. More importantly, the remains of these creatures should be present in the fossil record. The number of these transitional forms should have been even greater than that of present animal species, and their remains should be found all over the world. Darwin hoped that transitional forms of animal species gradually evolving into different species would eventually be discovered at some future time in the fossil record. To this day, however, no such transitional forms have ever been found anywhere in the world. Darwin's observations regarding natural selection and adaptation were certainly correct. So-called microevolution of various traits and characteristics within a species has been confirmed and widely exists. But macroevolution, the supposed transformation from one species into a completely different species, has never been observed, and no evidence of such evolution exists anywhere in the fossil record. Colin Patterson, senior paleontologist for the British Museum of Natural History and an ardent evolutionist, even he admits that Darwinists must concede natural selection has never been observed to actually cause anything to evolve. He said, No one has ever produced a species by mechanism of natural selection. No one has ever got near it, and most of the current argument in neo-Darwinism is about this question. Harun Yahya wrote, even in the most scientific books about evolution, the stage of transition from water to land, one of the unexplainable points of evolution, is given in such simplicity that they do not prove to be believable even for children. According to evolution, life began in water, and the first developed animals on earth were fish. According to the story, one day fish species developed the ability to climb out of the water and moved on land. The theory continues that fish which chose to live on land had feet instead of fins, and lungs instead of gills. In most of the books about evolution, nobody explains why the transition occurred. Even in the most scientific sources, writers suddenly jump to conclusions like, and transition from water to land occurred, without providing a satisfactory answer regarding how the process worked. Yet, how did this transformation occur? It is obvious that a fish cannot survive out of water for more than one or two minutes. If we assume that a drought really existed, as claimed by evolutionists, and fish were, for some reason, drawn to lands, then what would happen to fish even if this process lasts for ten millions of years? The answer is straight. Fish leaving the water would inevitably die in a few moments. Even if this process lasted for ten million years, the answer would still be the same. All fish would die one by one. Nobody would dare say, maybe after four million years, 
some of the fish suddenly acquired lungs while they were trying to survive. This would no doubt be an illogical assertion. However, that is exactly what evolutionists claim. The theory of evolution supposes that life somehow originated and evolved in the sea until somehow something that had theretofore lived only underwater grew lungs and feet and started living on land. Darwinists claim fish, creatures living only underwater, turned into amphibians, creatures living on both land and water, and then amphibians evolved into reptiles, creatures living only on land. Then they propose some reptiles evolved wings and became birds, while other reptiles evolved and became mammals. None of these transitional forms have ever been found, however, nor could they realistically exist either. For example, amphibian eggs develop only in water, whereas amniotic eggs develop only on land, so some sort of gradual step-by-step -step evolution scenario is impossible, since without perfect, complete eggs, a species cannot survive. Reptiles, allegedly evolving into mammals, is another example of evolutionist wishful thinking. Reptiles are cold-blooded, lay eggs, do not suckle their young, have one middle ear bone, three mandible bones, and bodies covered in scales, whereas mammals are warm-blooded, have live births, suckle their young, have three middle ear bones, one mandible, and are covered in fur or hair. Far too many distinct differences for gradual evolution. Reptiles evolving wings is another sheer impossibility, as the structure of land-dwelling reptiles and air-dwelling birds are far too different. Engin Quirer, a Turkish evolutionist, admits the problem wings present to Darwin's theory. The common trait of the eyes and the wings is that they can only function if they are fully developed. In other words, a halfway developed eye cannot see. A bird with half-formed wings cannot fly. How these organs came into being has remained one of the mysteries of nature that needs to be enlightened. Harun Yahya wrote, Although it is cloaked in the guise of science, the theory of evolution is nothing but a deceit, a deceit defended only for the benefit of materialistic philosophy, a deceit based not on science but on brainwashing propaganda and fraud. The theory of evolution is a theory that fails from the very first step, the reason is that evolutionists are unable to explain even the formation of a single protein. Neither the laws of probability nor the laws of physics and chemistry offer any chance for the fortuitous formation of life. Does it sound logical or reasonable when not even a single chance-formed protein can exist that millions of such proteins combined in an order to produce the cell of a living thing and that billions of cells manage to form and then come together by chance to produce living things and that from them generated fish and that those that passed to land turned into reptiles, birds, and that this is how all the millions of different species on earth were formed? They have never found a single transitional form, such as a half-fish, half-reptile, or half-reptile, half-bird, nor have they been able to prove that a protein, or even a single amino acid molecule composing a protein, could have formed under what they call primordial earth conditions. Not even in their elaborately equipped laboratories have they succeeded in doing that. Darwin's theory is a concept that concerns not only biology, chemistry, astronomy, and metaphysics, but actually formed the basis for a new political outlook as well. Within a very short time, this new progressive political attitude was redefined as social Darwinism, and as many historians have suggested, social Darwinism became the ideological basis of fascism, communism, and eugenics. Darwin's idea of natural selection and survival of the fittest were central to the insane ideologies of many of the 20th century's worst mass murderers, including Mao, Stalin, Lenin, Trotsky, Marx, and Pol Pot. Charles Darwin himself was a blatant racist who elucidated in his book The Descent of Man how blacks and aborigines, due to their inferiority to Caucasians, would be done away with by the civilized races in time. Freemasonic records state that Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was a philosopher, scientist, and physician who advanced ideas on evolution back in the 18th century. Before coming to Derby in 1788, Dr. Darwin had been made a mason in the famous Time Immemorial Lodge of Canongate Kilwinning No. 2 of Scotland. He also maintained close connections to the Jacobin Masons in France and Adam Weishaupt's Illuminati. Sir Francis Darwin and Reginald Darwin, two of his sons, were also made masons in Tyrian Lodge No. 253 at Derby. 
Charles Darwin does not appear on the rolls of the lodge, but it is most likely that he, like his grandfather, his sons, and his bulldog, T. H. Huxley, was a mason. Charles wrote that he used to listen to his grandfather's ideas of evolution and was greatly influenced by them. Erasmus was the first man to put forward the notion of evolution in England. He was known as a respected person, but he had a very dark private life, and at least two illegitimate children. Charles himself would go on to marry his first cousin, and have three children die due to complications from inbreeding. Harun Yahya wrote, Masons, thinking that Darwinism could serve their goals, played a great role in its dissemination among the masses. As soon as Darwin's theory was published, a group of volunteer propagandists formed around it, the most famous of whom was Thomas Huxley, who was called Darwin's Bulldog. Huxley, whose ardent advocacy of Darwinism was the single factor most responsible for its rapid acceptance, brought the world's attention to the theory of evolution in the debate at the Oxford University Museum in which he entered into on June 30th, 1860 with the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce. Huxley's great dedication to spreading the idea of evolution, together with his establishment connections, is brought into further light according to the following fact. Huxley was a member of the Royal Society, one of England's most prestigious scientific institutions, and, like nearly all the other members of this institution, was a senior mason. Other members of the Royal Society lent Darwin significant support. In short, Darwin wasn't acting alone. From the moment his theory was proposed, he received the support that came from the social classes and groups whose nucleus was made up of masons. An important example which proves the fact that Darwinism is one of the biggest deceptions of atheistic Freemasonry is a resolution carried in a Mason meeting. The 33rd degree Supreme Council of Mizraim Freemasonry at Paris reveals in its minutes its promotion of evolution as science, while they themselves scoffed at the theory. The minutes read as follows. It is with this object in view, the scientific theory of evolution, that we are constantly, by means of our press, arousing a blind confidence in these theories. The intellectuals will puff themselves up with their knowledge, and without any logical verification of them, will put into effect all the information available from science, which our agentura specialists have cunningly pieced together for the purpose of educating their minds in the direction we want. Do not suppose for a moment that these statements are empty words. Think carefully of the successes we arranged for Darwinism. Atheistic Freemasonry in the United States has picked up the resolution of Mizraim before long. New Age magazine in its March 1922 issue stated that the kingdom of atheistic Freemasonry will be established by evolution and the development of man himself. As seen above, the false scientific image of evolution is a deception set in the 33rd degree atheist Masonic lodges. Atheist Masons openly admit that they will use the scientists and media which are under their control to present this deception as scientific, which even they find funny. The Mimar Sinan journal published by the Turkish Great Freemasonry Lodge has openly discussed their mission to use Darwinism to overthrow religion and belief in God. One article mentioned, Today, the only valid scientific theory accepted both by most civilized countries and underdeveloped ones remains to be Darwinism. However, neither the church nor other religions have collapsed yet. The legend of Adam and Eve is still being taught as religious teaching in holy books. In other words, it seems that one of the main goals of modern Masons, besides convincing people of the Baal Earth and Big Bang, is to abolish creationism and replace it with their godless myth of blind chance evolution. Just like Copernicus never claimed to have any new or special evidence for his heliocentric theory, Darwin never claimed to have any verifiable scientific evidence proving his evolution theory, yet here we are 150 years later, no closer to a proof of either, but with the vast majority of indoctrinated sheeple convinced they are monkey men hanging from a spinning ball. Harun Yahya wrote, When we look at the Western media carefully, we frequently come across news dwelling on the theory of evolution. Leading media organizations and well-known and respectable magazines periodically bring this subject up. When their approach is examined, one gets the impression that this theory is an absolutely proven fact, leaving no room for discussion. Ordinary people reading this kind of news naturally start to think that the theory of evolution is a fact, as certain as any law of mathematics. They print headlines in big fonts. According to Time magazine, a new fossil that completes the gap in the fossil chain has been found. 
or Nature indicates that scientists have shed light on the final issues of evolutionary theory. The finding of the last missing link of the evolution chain means nothing because there is not a single thing proven about evolution. In short, both the media and academic circles, which are at the disposal of anti-religionist power centers, maintain an entirely evolutionist view, and they impose this on society. This imposition is so effective that it has, in time, turned evolution into an idea that is never to be rejected. Denying evolution is seen as being contradictory to science and fundamental realities. The information we have considered throughout this book has shown us that the theory of evolution has no scientific basis, and that, on the contrary, evolutionist claims conflict with scientific facts. In other words, the force that keeps evolution alive is not science. The theory of evolution is maintained by some scientists, but behind it there is another influence at work. This other influence is materialist philosophy. Materialist philosophy is one of the oldest beliefs in the world, and assumes the existence of matter as its basic principle. According to this view, matter has always existed, and everything that exists consists of matter. This makes belief in a creator impossible, of course, because if matter has always existed, and if everything consists of matter, then there can be no supermaterial creator who created it. The fact of the matter is, evolution is, was, and always has been a foregone conclusion by people looking for any answer other than God. When you metaphysically exclude the existence of an intelligent, creative consciousness behind the creation of the material world, the only answer left is random happenstance. Everything must be the result of coincidence, chance, and circumstance once you have excluded the possibility of a supreme intelligent creator. But no matter how diligently it is denied, the truth remains. You simply are not some cosmic accident, not the result of random happenstance, chance, or coincidence. Your eyes, your ears, your feelings, your life and consciousness are all the result of the most supremely intelligent design. My previous book, Spiritual Science, is a 284-page refutation of materialist science and philosophy, which proves far beyond any reasonable doubt that atheistic materialism is an invalid, untenable, destructive philosophy, and that consciousness and intelligence existed before and beyond all space, time, and matter. Malcolm Muggeridge, an atheist philosopher and supporter of evolution for 60 years, finally admitted before his death that, I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books in the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. Harun Yahya wrote, According to these professors, a number of simple chemical substances first came together and formed a protein which is no more possible than a randomly scattered collection of letters coming together to form a poem. Then, other coincidences led to the emergence of other proteins. These then also combined by chance in an organized manner, not just proteins, but DNA, RNA, enzymes, hormones, and cell organelles, all of which are very complex structures within the cell, coincidentally happen to emerge and come together. As a result of these billions of coincidences, the first cell came into being. If you put a carved stone or wooden idol in front of these people and told them, look, this idol created this room and everything in it, they would say that was utterly stupid and refuse to believe it. Yet, despite that, they declare the nonsense that the unconscious process known as chance gradually brought this world and all the billions of wonderful living things in it into being, to be the greatest scientific explanation. In short, these people regard chance as a god, and claim that it is intelligent, conscious, and powerful enough to create living things and all the sensitive balances in the universe. One of the first frauds in the history of Darwinism, known as recapitulation theory, and heralded as undeniable proof of evolution, was an idea proposed and propagated by a racist eugenicist professor named Ernest Haeckel in the late 19th century. A contemporary and friend of Charles Darwin, and Thomas Bulldog Huxley, Haeckel postulated that human and other animal embryos experience a miniature form of the entire evolutionary impulse during their development in the womb, displaying first characteristics of fish, then reptile, and lastly mammalian or human. It has long been eliminated from scientific literature, but many people and popular sources still unknowingly quote and believe in Haeckel's fraudulent work. 
several popular magazines and school textbooks as recently as the 1990s, over a century after being exposed, were still publishing Haeckel's hoaxed pictures and recapitulation theory as science fact, Harun Yahya wrote. It has since been proven that this theory is completely bogus. It is now known that the gills that supposedly appear in the early stages of the human embryo are in fact the initial phases of the middle ear canal, parathyroid, and thymus. The part of the embryo which was likened to the egg yolk pouch turns out to be a pouch that produces blood for the infant. The part that had been identified as a tail by Haeckel and his followers is in fact the backbone, which resembles a tail only because it takes shape before the legs do. Another interesting aspect of recapitulation was Ernest Haeckel himself, a faker who falsified his drawings in order to support the theory he advanced. Haeckel's forgeries purported to show that fish and human embryos resembled one another. When he was caught out, the only defense he offered was that other evolutionists had also committed similar offenses. Haeckel was charged with fraud by five professors and convicted by a university court at Jena, where he admitted that several of his drawings were forgeries, that he was merely filling in missing links where evidence was thin, and that hundreds of his contemporaries were guilty of the same charge. During the trial, he said, After this compromising confession of forgery, I should be obliged to consider myself condemned and annihilated if I had not the consolation of seeing side by side with me in the prisoner's dock hundreds of fellow culprits, among them many of the most trusted observers and most esteemed biologists. The great majority of all the diagrams in the best biological textbooks, treatises, and journals would incur in the same degree the charge of forgery, for all of them are inexact and are more or less doctored, schematized, and constructed. What an admission! Not only did Haeckel confess his own forgeries, but he admitted that there were hundreds of other scientific fraudsters similarly doctoring findings in the best biological textbooks, treatises, and journals, several of which will be examined in this chapter. As it turns out, Haeckel had simply copied and printed the same human embryo pictures several times over, claiming each were various other animal embryos with exact parallels, when in fact the parallels do not exist, and the pictures were copies he knowingly and intentionally made to suit his recapitulation idea. Malcolm Bowden wrote, To support his theory, Haeckel, whose knowledge of embryology was self-taught, faked some of his evidence. He not only altered his illustrations of embryos, but also printed the same plate of an embryo three times and labeled one a human, the second a dog, and the third a rabbit, to show their similarity. Dr. Michael Richardson wrote, This is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It's shocking to find that somebody one thought was a great scientist was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. What Haeckel did was to take a human embryo and copy it, pretending that the salamander and the pig and all the others looked the same at the same stage of development. They don't. These are fakes. For the past 150 years, evolutionist scientists have been working diligently to propagandize the public into believing that modern humans are descended from ancient apes. The final and most difficult theoretical leap for the theory of evolution is this supposed million-year transition from ape to human. The utter impossibility of evolving abilities like bipedality, erect spinal columns, and complex linguistic skills has been debated since the theory was first presented, but such obstacles will never stop die-hard evolutionists set on discovering, or inventing, a believable monkey-man transitional species. The first of these convenient evolutionary discoveries was the Neanderthal man, found in the Neander Valley of Germany in 1856 just in time for the release of Darwin's Origin of Species. To this day, reconstructed drawings of hairy ape-like Neanderthal men are depicted in scholarly journals and school textbooks, and claim to be a missing evolutionary link. The fact is, however, that all so-called Neanderthal remains have never been shown to be any more different from modern humans than an Asian from a Caucasian, or an Inuit from an Aborigine. Also, the skull size shows its brain was actually 13% larger than the average brain of modern man, making it impossible to be an intermediary between man and ape. Even Time magazine in 1971 proclaimed the primitiveness of Neanderthal to be unwarranted, that he could walk the street today unrecognized. One writer even commenting that historians of the future may declare all of us insane for not detecting and refuting this incredible blunder with adequate determination. 
One of the main proponents pushing Neanderthal man as an authentic species nowadays is Reiner Prosch, a German professor who dated the fossils at 36,000 years old, allowing them to fit perfectly in the evolutionist timeline. In 2005, however, Prosch was forced to retire in disgrace by a panel of Frankfurt University heads who determined he had fabricated data and plagiarized the work of his colleagues over the past 30 years. The once renowned carbon dating expert has presently been completely ostracized from the scientific community. It has since been determined that all Neanderthal skeletal remains are no more than a few thousand years old, some only a few hundred. They have also found modern human DNA in the bones, that their brain capacity was 13% larger than the modern average, their height 5 foot 9, comparable to our average, and they had advanced tools, buried their dead, and enjoyed art. University of Berlin professor Rudolf Virchow, Ernest Haeckel's former professor and the father of modern pathology, back in 1872 concluded the original Neanderthal remains were simply that of an unfortunate Homo sapiens who had suffered childhood rickets, adult arthritis, and was victim to several damaging blows to the head. Eric Trinkaus, a paleoanthropologist from New Mexico University, concluded his examination stating, Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern human have shown that there is nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. In 1891, the next ape-man discovery was found in Java, Indonesia, by Eugene Dubois, who coincidentally happened to be a student and apprentice of evolutionist hoaxer Ernest Haeckel. Dubois found a skull cap, a leg bone, a jaw fragment, and three teeth, from which he reconstructed the ape-like Java Man. Within ten years of its discovery, Java Man was the main subject of over 80 evolution books and articles. It was given the scientific name of Anthropopithecus erectus, and later changed to Pithecanthropus erectus, and finally Homo erectus, undoubtedly for super-official pseudoscientific reasons. Hank Hanegraaff wrote, Java Man was discovered by a Dutchman. I'm a little embarrassed by that because I'm a Dutchman myself. His name was Eugene Dubois. The bones were found in 1891 on an Indonesian island of Java in Southeast Asia along the banks of the Solo River. And there was an interesting assortment. He found a leg bone, a skull cap, a jaw fragment, and three teeth. And that's what he concocted Java Man from. Interestingly, some of the teeth were old and some young. The bones belonged to ape, female and male. It was an interesting conglomeration, and the reason that people didn't catch on to it is because the find of Dubois was kept from scholars for about 30 years. He also withheld the discovery of modern human remains, which were found in the same stratum as Java Man. Of course, that would have ruined his claims that Java Man was the ancestor of modern-day humans. Finally, enough pressure was placed on him that the actual bones were allowed to be examined and the discrepancies were found, and eventually, enlightened America, as well as the world, found out that this was a hoax. Unfortunately, hoaxes die hard. Recently, Time Magazine ran a cover story entitled How Man Became Man, and starts off ridiculing Christians and creationists, then goes on to present Java Man as though it were a fact. Java Man's teeth were found to be of different ages, and the bones a mixture of human and ape, with a giant gibbon skull. Rudolf Virchow, Haeckel's own professor and the foremost pathology expert of his time, stated, In my opinion, this creature was an animal, a giant gibbon, in fact, and the thigh bone has not the slightest connection with the skull. He and many others have concluded the thigh bone is quite clearly human, while the skull cap and teeth belong to a primate. In 1912, a doctor and paleoanthropologist named Charles Dawson claimed to have found a jawbone and cranial fragment of an ape-man transitional form in a pit in Piltdown, England. It was alleged to be 500,000 years old and was displayed as absolute proof of human evolution in museums across the world. For the next 40 years, scores of scientific articles, artist reconstructions, and over 500 doctoral theses were written about Piltdown Man. Objections and criticisms were raised immediately by contemporaries like Arthur Keith, but managed to be mitigated by Dawson until 1953, when tests proved conclusively that the Piltdown skull was actually human and only a few hundred years old, while the lower protruding jaw was from a recently deceased orangutan. 
Investigators found that Dawson had artificially worn down the orangutan jaw and that the primitive tools discovered alongside the fossils were imitations Dawson had sharpened with steel implements. Dawson also filled the molar surfaces of the teeth to more resemble those of man and stained all the fossils with potassium dichromate to give them an antiquated appearance. The stains quickly disappeared when dipped in acid, however. Wilfred Legras Clark, a member of Joseph Weiner's team who uncovered the forgery, stated that the evidences of artificial abrasion immediately sprang to the eye. Indeed, so obvious did they seem that it may well be asked how was it that they had escaped notice before? Within days, Piltdown Man was removed from the British Museum where it had been on display for four decades. Since conclusively being proven a hoax in 1953, many of Dawson's other paleontological finds have also proven to be fakes or planted. In 2003, Dr. Miles Russell of Bournemouth University published the results of an investigation into Dawson's antiquarian collection, concluding that at least 38 specimens were clear fakes, noting that Dawson's entire academic career appears to have been built upon deceit, sleight of hand, fraud, and deception, the ultimate gain being international recognition. The next fraudulent attempt at creating and propagating a supposed ape-man transitional form was carried out in 1922 by Henry Fairfield Osborne, co-founder of the American Eugenics Society, president of the White Supremacist Pioneer Fund, and director of the American Museum of Natural History. Osborne declared that he had been sent an anomalous tooth found in Snakebrook, Nebraska, which had characteristics of both ape and man. He determined that it came from the Pliocene period of ancient history, and affectionately labeled the tooth's owner, Nebraska Man. Harun Yahya wrote, Nebraska Man was immediately given a scientific name, Hesperopithecus Harold Kukai. Many authorities gave Osborne their support. Based on this single tooth, reconstructions of the Nebraska Man's head and body were drawn. Moreover, Nebraska Man was even pictured along with his wife and children as a whole family in a natural setting. Once Nebraska Man made the media rounds of popular publications, and the pliable public was sufficiently propagandized, the story disappeared until 1928, when William Bryan and William Gregory had the opportunity to independently examine the tooth. Their investigations both conclusively found that the tooth did not belong to a man or ape, but was actually from an extinct species of wild American pig called Presthenops. After William Gregory published his article, Hesperopithecus, apparently not ape nor a man, in Science Magazine, all drawings and models of Nebraska Man and his family were quickly removed from evolutionist publications. Henry Osborne himself was forced to concede that Nebraska Man, Hesperopithecus Harold Kukai, the supposed example of the Pliocene Pithecanthropus erectus, and his whole imaginary family were completely fictional fabrications. He never admitted to intentional fraud, and why would he? But as an ardent evolutionist, eugenicist, and white supremacist, a level of confirmation bias was likely. Osborne was even such a sadistic racist that he was quoted during a national debate unabashedly saying of World War I army intelligence tests that, I believe those tests were worth what the war cost, even in human life. We have learned once and for all that the Negro is not like us. Harun Yahya wrote, after Darwinism advanced the claim with his book The Descent of Man that man evolved from ape-like living beings, he started to seek fossils to support this contention. However, some evolutionists believed that half-man, half-ape creatures were to be found not only in the fossil record, but also alive in various parts of the world. In the early 20th century, these pursuits for living transitional links led to unfortunate incidents one of the cruelest of which is the story of a pygmy by the name of Odabenga. Odabenga was captured in 1904 by an evolutionist researcher in the Congo. In his own tongue, his name meant friend. He had a wife and two children. Chained and caged like an animal, he was taken to the USA where evolutionist scientists displayed him to the public in the St. Louis World Fair along with other ape species and introduced him as the closest transitional link to man. Two years later, they took him to the Bronx Zoo in New York, and there they exhibited him under the denomination of Ancient Ancestors of Man, along with a few chimpanzee, a gorilla named Dina, and an orangutan called Duhong. 
Dr. William Hornaday, the zoo's evolutionist director, gave long speeches on how proud he was to have this exceptional transitional form in his zoo, and treated caged Odabenga as if he were an ordinary animal. Unable to bear the treatment he was subjected to, Odabenga eventually committed suicide. Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man, Odabenga. These scandals demonstrate that evolutionist scientists do not hesitate to employ any kind of unscientific method to prove their theories. In 1927, Davidson Black declared he had discovered five crushed skulls and several teeth near Beijing belonging to an ancient ape-man species now widely known as Peking Man, or Baking Man. Somewhere between 1941 and 1945, all the original bones were mysteriously lost, however, leaving only a few plaster casts left to examine. At the same site, where this supposed missing link was found, there were also found the remains of ten fully human skeletons who quarried nearby limestone, built fires, and left behind a variety of tools. Many scientists now believe the tools were used on Peking men rather than by them. The back of the skulls were all bashed in, and in that part of the world, monkey brains are a delicacy, so it is likely that Peking man were actually Peking apes, and they were man's meal, not man's ancient ancestor. In 1974, Donald Johansson discovered Lucy, a three-foot-tall, supposedly three-million-year-old Australopithecine in Ethiopia. Widely publicized as our oldest direct human ancestor, Lucy made the usual rounds of scientific magazine journals and school textbooks. Don Johansson modestly claimed that Lucy was the most important find made by anyone in the history of the entire human race. And the media heralded him a hero. He was promoted from assistant professor to receiving his own Institute for Human Biology at Berkeley. During all this time, he never allowed scientists to examine Lucy's bones until 1982, eight years later. Since then, and as more Australopithecine skeletons have been found and examined, however, many leading evolutionists agree that Lucy is simply an extinct type of ape, similar to modern pygmy chimpanzees, and nothing more. They may have walked slightly more upright than most apes, but were not bipedal or erect, could not talk, spent most of their time on trees, and walked on all fours. Lord Solly Zuckerman and Professor Charles Oxnard did 15 years of research on Australopithecines along with a team of five specialists, coming to the conclusion that all the various specimens of Australopithecus they examined were only an ordinary ape genus and definitely not bipedal. The French Science and Life magazine ran the cover story in May 1999, Goodbye Lucy, writing about how Lucy, the most famous fossil of Australopithecus, was not the root of the human race and needs to be removed from our supposed family tree. However, even now in 2014, a movie named Lucy has just been released by Masonic Universal Pictures, where the Lucy ape woman fraud is still treated as scientific fact throughout the entire movie. In 1982, a skull fragment found in the Spanish town of Ors was hailed to be the oldest fossilized human remain ever found in Eurasia. Orse Man was supposedly a 17-year-old ape man who lived between 900,000 and 1,600,000 years ago, and was presented to the world with the usual reconstructed drawings showing a young, hairy, man-ape teenager. In 1983, however, a team of scientists from France concluded that the skull fragment was actually from a four-month-old donkey. A three-day scientific symposium had been scheduled so experts could examine and discuss the bone, but was immediately cancelled after the French investigation. Embarrassed Spanish officials sent out 500 letters to the would-be attendees apologizing. After more conclusive tests, the Daily Telegraph on May 14, 1984 carried the headline, Ass Taken for Man. Later in 1984, Kamoya Kimu, in a team led by paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey, discovered Turkanaboy at Nariakatom, near Lake Turkana, Kenya. Turkanaboy was proclaimed to be a preteen boy from 1.5 to 1.6 million years ago and is now regarded as the most complete early human skeleton ever found. Much like Neanderthal man, however, Turkanaboy, or Nariakatomi Homo erectus, is no different from modern man. American paleoanthropologist Alan Walker said, I doubt the average pathologist could tell the difference between the fossil skeleton and that of a modern human. He wrote that he laughed upon first seeing it because it looked so much like a Neanderthal. 
Turkanaboy was bipedal, with arms and legs of human proportions, an upright skeletal structure, comparable in height, cranial size, and development rate of modern humans. Even the discovering team leader, Richard Leakey, stated that the difference between this specimen of Homo erectus and modern man are no more pronounced than simple racial variances. The shape of the skull, the degree of protrusion of the face, the robustness of the brows, and so on, these differences are probably no more pronounced than we see today between the separate geographical races of modern humans. Such biological variation arises when populations are geographically separated from each other for significant lengths of time. So when seen for what they really are, all the supposed ape men discoveries and reconstructions are nothing but frauds and fantasies. Neanderthal man was just an ordinary man. Java man and Piltdown man were composed of human and ape bones. Nebraska man was actually a pig. Peking man was actually man's meal. Lucy was just a monkey, Orse Man was a donkey, and Turkana Boy was just a boy. Harun Yahya wrote, Reconstruction can be explained as drawing a picture or constructing a model of a living thing based on a single bone, sometimes only a fragment that has been unearthed. The ape men we see in newspapers, magazines, or films are all reconstructions. The fossils that are claimed to be evidence for the human evolution scenario are in fact products of fraud. For more than 150 years, not even a single fossil to prove evolution has been found. As a matter of fact, the reconstructions, drawings, or models of the fossil remains made by the evolutionists are prepped speculatively precisely to validate the evolutionary thesis. David R. Pilbeam, an anthropologist from Harvard, stresses this fact when he says, At least in paleoanthropology, data are still so sparse that theory heavily influences interpretations theories have, in the past, clearly reflected our current ideologies instead of the actual data. Since people are highly affected by visual information, these reconstructions best serve the purpose of evolutionists, which is to convince people that these reconstructed creatures really existed in the past. All the many models, drawings, cartoons, mannequins, and movies made involving various ape men are complete fiction and fabrication, because no one can actually accurately determine the outward appearance of an animal based solely on bone structure. Soft tissue, which vanishes quickly after death and is responsible for the look of one's eyes, ears, nose, lips, hair, eyebrows, skin, etc., totally depends on the imagination of the person reconstructing them. Ernest A. Houghton of Harvard University stated, to attempt to restore the soft parts is an even more hazardous undertaking. The lips, the eyes, the ears, and the nasal tip leave no clues on the underlying bony parts. You can with equal facility model on a Neanderthaloid skull the features of a chimpanzee or the lineaments of a philosopher. These alleged restorations of ancient types of man have very little, if any, scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public. So put not your trust in reconstructions. There is no concrete fossil evidence to support the ape-man image which is unceasingly promulgated by the media and evolutionist academic circles. With brushes in their hands, evolutionists produce imaginary creatures. Nevertheless, the fact that these drawings correspond to no matching fossils constitutes a serious problem for them. One of the interesting methods they employ to overcome this problem is to produce the fossils they cannot find. Piltdown Man, which may be the biggest scandal in the history of science, is a typical example of this method. The current evolutionist ape-to-human transitional theory goes Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. Australopithecus, which means southern ape, has been proven to be nothing but an extinct ape which closely resembles many modern chimpanzees in height, arm and leg length, skull shape, teeth, mandibular structure, and many other details. Homo habilis, a hypothetical classification created in the 1960s by Turkana boy team leader Richard Leakey, was what evolutionists deemed necessary to exist between Australopithecus and Homo erectus because the jump was far too drastic. There needed to be a species of ape-man with a larger cranial capacity that could walk upright and use tools. Serendipitously for his career, fossils unearthed in the late 1980s were deemed Homo habilis, and Leakey was regarded a scientific genius. That is, until his contemporaries Bernard Wood and C. Loring Brace determined the Homo habilis arms were too long, legs were too short, and skeletal structure too ape-like to be anything but an ape. Their fingers and toes were that of tree climbers, and their jaws and cranial capacities were comparable to modern apes. 
American anthropologist Holly Smith in 1994 concluded Homo habilis was not Homo, or human, at all, but simply an ape, just like Australopithecus. She stated that Restricting analysis of fossils to specimens satisfying these criteria, patterns of dental development of Australopithecines and Homo habilis, remain classified with African apes. Those of Homo erectus and Neanderthals are classified with humans. So Australopithecus and Homo habilis, the first two classifications, are both actually fully ape, while Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, the second two classifications, are in fact fully human and comparable to modern man, with variances no greater than the natural variances of race and genetics. So even after 150 years of discoveries, evolutionists are no closer to finding a true transitional species existing between ape and man, and no closer to proving their theory. Nor can they answer how apes could develop bipedality, human arm and leg length ratios, erect spinal columns, and complex linguistic skills. If humans evolved from apes, why do apes still exist? Why don't any of these supposed transitional forms still exist now, and where are true examples in the fossil record? The class Dinosauria was originally defined by Sir Richard Owen of the Royal Society and Superintendent of the British Museum Natural History Department in 1842, or in other words, the existence of dinosaurs was first speculatively hypothesized by a knighted museum head coincidentally in the mid-19th century during the heyday of evolutionism before a single dinosaur fossil had ever been found. The Masonic media and mainstream press worldwide got to work hyping stories of these supposed long-lost animals, and then, lo and behold, twelve years later, in 1854, Ferdinand van de Veer Hayden, during his exploration of the Upper Missouri River, found proof of Owen's theory. A few unidentified teeth he mailed to leading paleontologist Joseph Leedy, who several years later declared them to be from an ancient, extinct Trachodon dinosaur, which beyond ironically means rough tooth. Firstly, it should be needless to say that it is impossible to reconstruct an entire hypothetical ancient animal based on a few teeth. But even more importantly, it is dubious that a myriad of ancient reptile bird and reptile mammal transitional forms necessary for the blossoming theory of evolution would be hypothesized and then conveniently discovered by teams of evolutionist archaeologists purposely out looking to find such fossils. And it is even more dubious that such fossils have supposedly existed for millions of years but were never found by or known to any civilization in the history of humanity until evolutionism's Masonic Renaissance in the mid-19th century. David Wozni wrote, Why are there no discoveries by Native Americans in all the years previous when they roamed the American continents? There is no belief of dinosaurs in the Native American religion or tradition. For that matter, why were there no discoveries prior to the 19th century in any part of the world? According to the World Book Encyclopedia, before the 1800s, no one ever knew that dinosaurs existed. During the late 1800s and early 1900s, large deposits of dinosaur remains were discovered. Why has man suddenly made all these discoveries? No tribes, cultures, or countries in the world ever discovered a dinosaur bone before the mid-1800s, and then they were suddenly found all over the world in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Argentina, Belgium, Mongolia, Tanzania, West Germany, and many other places apparently had large deposits of dinosaur fossils never before seen. All these places were inhabited and well explored for thousands of years before this time. Why had no one ever found a dinosaur fossil before? According to the book The Dinosaur Project, paleontological journalist Wayne Grady claims the period following this, from around 1870 to 1880, became a period in North America where some of the most underhanded shenanigans in the history of science were conducted. In what was known as the Great Dinosaur Rush, or the Bone Wars, Edward Drinker Cope of the Academy of Natural Sciences and Othniel Marsh of the Peabody Museum of Natural History began a lifelong rivalry and passion for dinosaur hunting. 
They started out as friends, but became bitter enemies during a legendary feud involving double-crossing, slander, bribery, theft, spying, and destruction of bones by both parties. Marsh is said to have discovered over 500 different ancient species, including 80 dinosaurs, while Cope discovered 56. Out of the 136 dinosaur species supposedly discovered by the two men, however, only 32 are presently considered valid, as the rest have all proven to be falsifications and fabrications. None of them once claimed to find a complete skeleton either, so all their work involved reconstructions. In fact, to this day, no complete skeleton has ever been found, and so all dinosaurs are reconstructions. David Wozni wrote, Discoveries and excavations seem not to be made by disinterested people, such as farmers, ranchers, hikers, outdoor recreationists, building construction industry basement excavators, pipeline trench diggers, and mining industry personnel, but rather by people with a vested interest, such as paleontologists, scientists, university professors, and museum organization personnel who were intentionally looking for dinosaur bones or who have studied dinosaurs previously. Finds are often made during special dinosaur bone hunting trips and expeditions by these people to faraway regions already inhabited and explored. This seems highly implausible. More believable is the case of the discovery of the first original Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, which were unintentionally discovered by a child and which were all published by 1955. In some cases of a discovery of dinosaur bones by a disinterested person, it was suggested to them by some professional in the field to look or dig in a certain area. Also very interesting to note are special areas set aside and designated as dinosaur parks for which amateur dinosaur hunters are required to first obtain a dinosaur hunting license. Whatever destination these establishment-funded archaeologists and paleontologists set, it seemed they found incredible numbers of fossils in tiny areas. In one of the largest dinosaur excavation sites, called the Ruth Mason Quarry, over 2,000 fossils were allegedly discovered. Casts and original skeletons assembled from these bones are currently on display in over 60 museums worldwide. Florentino Amagino, head of paleontology at La Plata Museum, is amazingly responsible for 6,000 fossil species supposedly discovered throughout his career, all in Argentina. Dinosaur hunter Earl Douglas sent 350 tons of excavated dinosaur bones to the Carnegie Museum of Natural History throughout his career, all coming from the Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. During an expedition to Patagonia, Dr. Louis Chiappe and Dr. Lowell Dingus supposedly discovered thousands of dinosaur eggs at a site of only a few hundred square yards. Many experts have mentioned how such finds of huge quantities of fossils in one area by just a few highly invested individuals goes against the laws of natural probability and lends credence to the likelihood of forgeries or concentrated planting efforts. David Wozni wrote, Dinosaur bones sell for a lot of money at auctions. It is a profitable business. There is pressure for academics to publish papers. Museums are in the business of producing displays that are popular and appealing. Movie producers and the media need to produce material to sell to stay in business. The mainstream media loves to hype alleged dinosaur finds. Much is to be gained by converting a bland, non-dinosaur discovery of a bone of modern origin into an impressive dinosaur find and letting artists' interpretations and imaginations take the spotlight rather than the basic, boring, real find. There are people who desire and crave prestige, fame, and attention. There is the bandwagon effect and crowd behavior. And then there are people and entities pursuing political and religious agendas. Highly rewarding financial and economic benefits to museums, educational and research organizations, university departments of paleontology, discoverers and owners of dinosaur bones, and the book, television, movie, and media industries may cause sufficient motivations for ridiculing of open questioning and for suppression of honest investigation. The fact that T-Rex bones have sold at auctions for upward of $12 million shows how lucrative the field of dinosaur hunting can be, and it just happens to be museum officials who serendipitously seem to make the most prolific finds. The first dinosaur to ever be publicly displayed 
was the Hadrosaurus fulci at Edward Drinker Cope's Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. The bones were co-discovered by Joseph Lady, Cope's esteemed professor, and the man responsible for the Trachodon Toothosaurus. The original Hadrosaurus reconstruction, which is still on display today, shows a huge plaster cast bipedal reptile standing upright using its tail as a third leg. What few people know, however, is that no skull was ever discovered and no original bones were put in the public exhibit. David Wozniak wrote, a visual and a sculptural artist were promptly hired to invent a skull, and from the illustrations of another artist who had depicted the Iguanodon, the two artists drew the same face for the Hadrosaurus fulci. The people involved could now technically defend the existence of this dinosaur if someone were to ask. The stunt worked out so well and fooled the public so thoroughly that they could later change the head of the creature without anyone noticing. To this day, Hadrosaurus fulci is on display at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. The bones are said to be kept behind heavy closed doors, but a plaster copy is exhibited in their place. So we learn of an iguana skull being substituted for the skull of a dinosaur on display. What was the public told at the time? What are we not being told today? What we are not being told is that this is the rule and not the exception. To this day, not a single complete skeleton of any dinosaur has ever been found. All the museum displays, models, mannequins, cartoons, and movies of prehistoric monsters you have ever seen are all imaginative reconstructions based on incomplete skeletons arranged in a manner paleontologists believe to be most realistic. Furthermore, the skeletons exhibited in museums are all admittedly intricate fabrications made of plaster, fiberglass, various epoxies, and other animal bones, not original fossils. When dinosaur bones are transported and prepared, they use strips of burlap soaked in plaster to jacket over the fossils. Then, after applying a tissue separator to keep the plaster from direct contact with the bone, the soaked burlap strips are laid on until it is totally encased in a protective, mummy-like coating ready for safe transport. In an article titled, A Fossil's Trail from Excavation to Exhibit, one insider remarked that, Through mold-making and casting, we can totally fabricate limbs, ribs, vertebrae, etc. for the missing pieces of an articulated skeletal mount. Plaster, fiberglass, and epoxies are often and commonly used. In reconstruction work on single bones, small to large cracks can be filled in with mache or plaster mixed with dextrin, a starch that imparts an adhesive quality and extra hardness to regular molding plaster. We've also had success using epoxy putties. Large missing fragments can be sculpted directly in place with these same materials. In other words, Museum personnel work with plaster and other materials to transport and fabricate skeletons and missing or incomplete bones all the time. In fact, the huge dinosaur bone displays found in museums across the world are admittedly carefully prepared fakes. No independent researcher has ever examined a real dinosaur. They claim all the actual fossils are kept in high security storage but only a select few paleontologists are ever allowed to examine them, so the ability to ascertain their authenticity is kept from the general public. Robin Kofud wrote, Most people believe that dinosaur skeletons displayed in museums consist of real dinosaur bones. This is not the case. The real bones are incarcerated in thick vaults to which only a select few highly placed researchers hold a key, which means that no independent researcher has ever handled a Tyrannosaurus rex bone when people unaffiliated with the paleontological establishment attempt to gain access in order to study these dinosaur bones, they are met with refusal upon refusal. Only around 2,100 dinosaur bone sets have been discovered worldwide, and out of these, only 15 incomplete Tyrannosaurus rex bone sets have been found. These dinosaur bone sets have never formed a complete skeleton, but from these incomplete bone sets, paleontologists have constructed a hypothesis about the appearance of the whole skeleton which they have modeled in plastic. If thousands of long necks and large carnivorous reptiles had really roamed the earth, we wouldn't only have found 2,100 dinosaur bone sets, but millions of bones, with ordinary people tripping over them when digging in their vegetable patches. David Wozniak wrote, When children go to a dinosaur museum, are the displays they see displays of science, or displays of art and science fiction? 
Are we being deceived and brainwashed at an early age into believing a dinosaur myth? Deep, probing questions need to be asked of the entire dinosaur business. There may have been an ongoing effort since the earliest dinosaur discoveries to plant, mix, and match bones of various animals, such as crocodiles, alligators, iguanas, giraffes, elephants, cattle, kangaroos, ostriches, emus, dolphins, whales, rhinoceroses, etc., to construct and create a new man-made concept, prehistoric animal, called the dinosaur where bones from existing animals are not satisfactory for deception purposes, plaster substitutes may be manufactured and used. Some materials similar or superior to plasticine clay or plaster of Paris would be suitable. Molds may also be employed. What would be the motivation for such a deceptive endeavor? Obvious motivations include trying to prove evolution, trying to disprove or cast doubt on the Bible and the existence of a god, and trying to disprove the young earth theory. The dinosaur concept implies that if God exists, he tinkered with his idea of dinosaurs for a while, then probably discarded or became tired of this creation, and then went on to create man. The presented dinosaur historical timeline suggests an imperfect God who came up with the idea of man as an afterthought, thus demoting the biblical idea that God created man in his own image. Type dinosaur skulls into a search engine, and you will find a variety of replicas, tailor-made dinosaurs, and museum-quality skeletons. One of the largest and most renowned suppliers of fake dinosaurs is the Zigong Dino Ocean Art Company in Sichuan, China, which provides natural history museums worldwide with ultra-realistic dinosaur skeletons made from real bones. Chicken, frog, dog, cat, Horse and pig's bones are melted down, mixed with glue, resin, and plaster, then used as base material for recasting as dinosaur bones. They are even given intentional fractures and an antiquated, fossilized look to achieve the right effect. Their website boasts, Over 62% of our output goes to American and European markets, which means we will understand and are familiar with the intricacies and regulation of exporting to these regions. Since we are a partner of dinosaur museums, all products are made under the guidance of experts of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. We have gained a global sales network, reaching the USA, Brazil, France, Poland, Russia, Germany, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, exhibited in Peru, Argentina, Vancouver, Cincinnati, Chicago, and other places. As Alan Fiducia, University of North Carolina paleontology professor, wrote, I have heard there is a fake fossil factory in northeast China, in Liaoning province near the deposits where many of these recent alleged feather dinosaurs were found. Or as David Wozni wrote, The possibility exists that key dinosaur bones on display have been artificially modified through sculpture and carving. Bone sculpture is not an unknown human activity. Many cultures participate in creating man-made objects out of existing bones, totally unrecognizable from the original shape. Is the dinosaur industry a customer of this sort of business? Is it possible that dinosaur skeleton replica are secretly assembled or manufactured in private buildings out of public view, with bones artificially constructed or used from a number of different modern-day animals? Why bother having any authentic original fossils at all if alleged replicas please the public? Another problem with dinosaurs is their unnatural structural dynamics. Many dinosaur skeletons and reconstructions feature bipedal monsters like the T-Rex with a forward-leaning torso and head far larger and heavier than its counterbalancing tail. Many museum displays cannot even stand up under their own weight. It is highly unlikely that beasts this large and disproportionate could exist at all. The loads acting on their skeletons are so great that calculations indicate the bones of the largest dinosaurs would buckle and crack under their own immense weight. Experts have also pointed out that dinosaurs would have to have moved much slower than portrayed in movies to prevent sudden shocks to their skeletons. David Wozni wrote, this idea of slow-moving animals does not agree with the biomechanical analysis of dinosaurs, which indicate that the dinosaurs were agile, active creatures. This is the paradox between the dinosaur's size and lifestyle. Many displays and drawings of dinosaurs appear to be an absurdity, showing a two-legged animal that would be totally off-balance, with the weight of head and abdomen much greater than weight of tail, which is supposed to act as a counterbalance. 
Is the dinosaur industry a case of science trying to meet public desires or expectations? The movie Jurassic Park is an example of showing dinosaurs much larger than any current displays in museums. After the movie came out, it is interesting to note that many articles were written asking, is this possible? I can recall a report of dinosaur DNA being discovered preserved in amber, which later turned out to be false. Robin Coford wrote, Overall, several millions of dollars have been spent promoting the existence of dinosaurs through movies, TV, magazines, and comics. The world of movies and paleontology are like Siamese twins. People's view on the existence of dinosaurs is based not on firm evidence, but on Hollywood-fixated artistic impressions. Documentaries colorfully illustrate each dinosaur's characteristics, like colors, weight, and muscle mass. But Don Lessam, advisor for Jurassic Park, admits that this is pure guesswork. Consider, for instance, the question of how much these dinosaurs weigh. Don Lessam says, scientists don't know how much dinosaurs weighed. Dinosaurs are presented to the public with colorful artistic reconstructions, drawings, models, mannequins, gigantic skeletons in museums, cartoons and movies showing these beasts in explicit detail, but the fact is, from the assigning and arrangement of bones in each species, to the impossible to discern soft tissue, skin, eyes, noses, color, hairiness, texture, etc., just like the many supposed ape-man species, all dinosaur reconstructions are 100% fictional fabrications created by invested and inventive evolutionists. They purposely present dinosaurs to children in the media to spark and bias their young imaginations toward their machinations. Cartoons like Ice Age and The Land Before Time, movies like Jurassic Park and Dinosaur Island, coloring books, dolls, plastic toys, elementary school textbooks, and huge displays in children's museums certainly have an effect on budding young minds. National Geographic and the Ice Age movies were produced by Mason Rupert Murdoch's News Corp and 20th Century Fox. The Masonic production company Universal Studios created Jurassic Park and The Land Before Time. They are owned by Comcast, whose main shareholders are Masons, J.P. Morgan, and the Rothschilds. Discovery Channel, which features many dinosaur documentaries, is also financially advised by N.M. Rothschilds and Sun Limited. Former paleontology student Michael Forsell claimed on a radio interview with leading paleontologist Jack Horner that he was a total fraud, fabricating evidence and perpetuating the myth of dinosaurs. He continued on saying, I started my career in the field of paleontology only to leave my studies once I realized the whole thing was a sham. It's nonsense. Most of the so-called skeletons in museums are actually plaster casts. They even do it openly on documentaries now, preserving the bones my ass. I struggled as a student mainly because I could not tell the difference between a fossilized egg and an ordinary rock, and of course, there is no difference. I was treated like a leper when I refused to buy into their propaganda and promptly left the course. Dinosaurs never existed. The whole shebang is a freak show. They just grab a couple of old bones and form them into their latest Frankenstein's monster-like exhibit. We are all being fooled, and it's wrong, but together we can stop it. Many claim that since dinosaur fossils have been radiometrically dated to be tens of millions of years old, that their authenticity is thus proven. The fact is, however, that the methods used to date dinosaur fossils involve not measuring the actual fossils, but the rocks near where they are found. Most fossils are found near the surface of the earth, and if a modern-day animal were to die in the area, paleontologists would be likely to date them the same age. Dr. Margaret Helder, in her book Completing the Picture, a handbook on museums and interpretive centers dealing with fossils, she writes, Scientists used to be very impressed with the potential of radiometric for coming up with absolutely reliable ages of some kinds of rocks. They do not feel that way anymore. Having had to deal with numerous calculated dates which are too young or too old compared with what they expected, scientists now admit that the process has many more uncertainties than they ever would have supposed in the early years. The public knows almost nothing about uncertainties in the dating of rocks. The impression that most people have received is that many rocks on Earth are extremely old and that the technology exists to make accurate measurements of the ages. Scientists have become more and more aware, however, that the measurements which the machines make may tell us nothing about the actual age of the rock.
One of the main reasons that evolutionists needed the existence of dinosaurs was to answer the complicated problems present in the theory of evolution, including sea-dwelling animals evolving into land-dwellers, reptiles evolving wings, feathers flying and becoming birds, as well as other reptiles evolving warm blood, live births, breasts, and becoming mammals, through their imaginary multi-million year timeline and a variety of supposed transitional dinosaur forms, the paleontological establishment has been promoting various sea dinosaur, reptile slash birds, and reptile slash mammals to bridge these gaps. Many professionals and experts in the field have disputed such findings as often as they have been presented, however. Dr. Storrs Olson, a Smithsonian Institute scientist, wrote, the idea of feathered dinosaurs and the theropod origin of birds is being actively promulgated by a cadre of zealous scientists acting in concert with certain editors at Nature and National Geographic who themselves have become outspoken and highly biased proselytizers of the faith. Truth and careful scientific weighing of evidence have been among the first casualties in their program, which is now fast becoming one of the grander scientific hoaxes of our age. No authentic feathers have ever been found with dinosaur fossils, though a few exposed hoaxes certainly attempted to fake it. Dr. Olson called the adding of feathers to their findings hype, wishful thinking, propaganda, nonsense fantasia, and a hoax. In the 1990s, many fossils with feathers were supposedly discovered in China, suspiciously close to the Zigong Dino Ocean Art Company, but when examined, Dr. Timothy Rowe found the so-called Confucius Soreness was an elaborate hoax. He also found the Archaeoraptor, supposedly discovered in the 90s, was composed of bones from five different animals. When Dr. Rowe presented his findings to National Geographic, the head scientist reportedly remarked, well, all of these have been fiddled with. National Geographic then proceeded with their news conferences and media stories about the Archaeoraptor fossils being genuine and having found the missing link in evolution. Robin Kofid wrote, In 1999, National Geographic magazine was busted when they presented in a colorful and fancily presented article The Missing Link, an Archaeoraptor dinosaur which was supposed to support the basic tenet of evolutionary theory that dinosaurs had slowly developed over millions of years. Their proof consisted of a fossil where carefully arranged bone imprints gave the impression of a creature half-dinosaur and half-bird. The scam was discovered during a CT scan which uncovered unnatural bone links. National Geographic magazine was later forced to admit when pressured that the fossil was man-made. Paleontologists claim that Archaeoteryx is another transitional form of bird evolved from dinosaurs, but this theory falls on its face against overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Other species like Confuciusornis, Launingornis, and Eolalavis have all been found to be contemporary with the Archaeoteryx and are indistinguishable from present-day birds. Alan Fiducia from University of North Carolina, one of the most famous ornithologists in the world, stated, I've studied bird skulls for 25 years, and I don't see any similarities whatsoever. I just don't see it. Theropod origin of birds, in my opinion, will be the greatest embarrassment of paleontology of the 20th century. Larry Martin from the University of Kansas, a paleoornithologist, says, To tell you the truth, if I had to support the dinosaur origin of birds with those characters, I'd be embarrassed every time I had to get up and talk about it. Even if dinosaurs did evolve into birds to fill their evolution gap, it does not explain how something like the common housefly could have evolved. Flies flap their wings simultaneously 500 times per second. Even the slightest dissonance in vibration would cause them to lose balance and fall. But this never happens. How could they evolve such an amazing and specialized ability? Why were dinosaurs never discovered before the evolutionist renaissance in the mid-19th century? Why do paleontologists think they can reconstruct an entire species of ancient animal from a few teeth? Why have so many dinosaur discoveries turned out to be hoaxes? Why are all authentic dinosaur fossils kept under tight lock and key away from any independent analysis? Why has erosion and weathering not destroyed all these supposed prints and fossils that are allegedly millions of years old? If dinosaurs were supposedly wiped out by a meteor impact or other such catastrophe, why is it that all the other various animal species that exist today were not similarly wiped out? 
There are many more questions which need to be answered before anyone in their right mind should consider the existence of dinosaurs anything but a convenient evolutionist myth. Robin Coford wrote, The paleontological establishment can control which hypotheses will be constructed through textbooks and the curriculum. In this way, students are brainwashed into a pseudo-reality controlled by text material and the teacher's authority. A short practical example. A random dental bone is found at an excavation site, and from this dental bone, the rest of the skeleton is guessed at. We are not kidding about this. The entire dinosaurian field of the paleontological program is a sham.